So our presenter today for the session, uh, Living Heritage in Practice, is uh, Kristen Kitherwood. She's the director of Living Heritage for Heritage Saskatchewan. She holds an MA in Folklore from Memorial uh, University of Newfoundland and lives in Treaty 4 territory in rural southern Saskatchewan. Born and raised on a century family farm on Treaty 4 territory, Kristen um, is the director of the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation, a filmmaker. And her body of work includes two documentaries produced by the National Film Board of Canada and, other, and uh, one other funded by the Canada Council for, for the Arts. She is a storyteller and a writer, in addition to her work for Heritage Saskatchewan. She believes in empowering communities to interpret and safeguard their own living heritage, and is a fierce advocate for the native prairie ecosystem and its natural and cultural landscapes. Um, so just a bit, bit of a housekeeping quickly. Um, I'll be hosting the session. I'll be keeping everyone's microphones off. You can help me with that. Uh, if you find that the bandwidth is a problem, you can also always turn off your cameras. I encourage you to ask your questions to the chat function. Uh, please wait until the end of the presentation to ask more involved questions so that everybody's screens don't blink too much. Um, it'll be up to Kristen to decide if she wants to uh, stop along the way to answer any questions. Uh, for the most part, we're going to uh, wait until the end of the session to um, ask them uh, as a whole. and. Um, I might ask you to uh, ask them directly uh, once again, once we get to that point. Uh, so that's what I have to say to introduce today's um, presentation. I'll let uh, Kristen to take it away. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you so much for, first of all, starting off this symposium series and for having me here today. And thanks for everyone else who's in attendance. So I'm gonna start with a story that some of you may have already heard me tell before. Um, and those of you who haven't, you're in for just a, a little bit of a Saskatchewan treat here. So the story goes like this, down in the Big Muddy, where you're more likely to run into a cactus than a cottonwood tree, there are millions of years of geological time exposed, it revealed in the exposed hillsides and buttes. Down in the Big Muddy, the only shelter from the scorching summer sun or the bitter winter wind is down in the coolies. They call the Big Muddy Badlands. Bad land. Bad for farming is what they meant, but it's good for other things. Growing grass, grazing, and hiding if you ever had a need for that. And there were certain people who did have a need for that. Now down in the Big Muddy, there is a line. Now some call it the medicine line. Others simply refer to it as the border. It lies right along the 49th parallel and it's invisible to the naked eye. And yet it's very real for that. It, it divides the Big Muddy in two so that part of it is in Montana in the United States and part of it is here in Canada, in Saskatchewan. Though at the time of this story, Saskatchewan as we know it now didn't actually exist yet. In this time, there were people that we now know as outlaws. And they had names like Dutch Henry, Sam Kelly, the Pigeon Toad Kid. They worked for local ranchers in the Big Muddy on the Canadian side. And on the weekends, they had a habit of stealing horses and cattle from their employers, running them down across that medicine line, selling them on the Mont Montana side, enjoying the profits of their sale, turning around, driving those same stolen horses and cattle and a few more besides back up across that medicine line and selling them again on the Canadian side. Now, of course, local ranchers on both sides weren't thrilled with that. And on the Canadian side, the Northwest Mounted Police Constable had the unenviable task of trying to track these outlaws down, but they were really good at getting away and they had different tricks for that. And sometimes they would hide in caves, which you can still see to this day in the Big Muddy Valley. And sometimes they made a run for it. And on at least one occasion, they had a helpful uh, ally, I guess you can say, in the form of a wild roan mare who lived on the banks of the Big Muddy Lake. Now this mare, she knew that lake, it was her territory, and she knew where it was safe to cross. And the outlaws would ride down the coulee, uh, hollering, maybe shooting a pistol off in the air or something, scaring that mare, she'd spook, take off across the lake, and they would follow behind her where it was safe to do so, where they wouldn't sink up to their chests in mud. Now that poor Northwest Mono police constable coming up behind them by the time he rode down to the banks of that lake. The outlaws, the wild roan mare, had already crossed. He didn't know the way across that was safe. 
he wasn't about to jeopardize his horse and so he had to ride all the way around the lake a distance of more than 20 miles and by that time the outlaws had made it off scots free once more so this the legend of the roan mare is a story that I heard from a rancher in the Big Muddy Valley years ago. And I've heard it in different iterations since from other ranchers and, and local people in that area. And I've probably told that story now hundreds of times. I use it all the time in my community workshops. And one of the first questions I ask after I tell that story is, do you think that's a true story? And the answer to that, I'll get into that in a minute. The answer to that isn't so important as the fact that the story is told at all. And as you can see here, this is a signpost that is um, in the Big Muddy Valley, Roan Mare Cooley. Um, all of the coolies in the Big Muddy Valley, which if you're not familiar, coolie is a local word derived from French, which basically in this area refers to um, sort of a cleft in a range of hills and in that cleft grow trees which means that there is water of some sort usually an underground spring so coolies are really important in the big muddy area which is a very dry um, inhospitable terrain and if it weren't for those coolies it would be really hard to live there um, though homesteaders made their homes there and indigenous people lived there for thousands of years um, because there's hundreds of archaeological artifacts and effigies and teepee rings that have been found in the area. So that's what a coolie is. They all have names and Roan Mare Coulee is one of those places and that's another question. What comes first, the name of that coolie or that story? So Again, in my workshops, I ask questions, is the story true? And I get people to raise their hands if they think it is or if they think it's not. I ask them, does it matter if it's true? Now as a folklore, from my perspective, the, the veracity of that story, whether or not the Roan Mare actually existed, hint she probably didn't, that's what makes it a legend, uh, isn't so important. What matters is that that story has been told and is still being told in that area by people who live there. It is part of that area's folklore, its intangible cultural heritage, and its living heritage. And in telling a story like that, um, that rancher who first told me the story and all the various local people who have told me that story in various ways since are actually telling me about place and about themselves in relation to that place. So I'm going to give you some of my background in place. Um, I was born and raised, as Jerome mentioned in the introduction, on a Century family farm in Treaty 4 territory in southern Saskatchewan near Ceylon, along the northern banks of the Gibson Creek in the rural municipality of The Gap. That's pretty specific, and there's a reason for that specificity. And I'll tell you, too, that that um, introduction or that placing myself uh, has changed over time. And it's changed even in the five years that I've uh, been doing this work in Saskatchewan, because living heritage is a dynamic force, which I'm going to be uh, sort of, uh, I'm going to be coming back to that point again and again throughout this presentation this afternoon. And that question at the bottom, where are you from? I really am asking that. And I really do want you to consider that because at the end of the presentation, um, when it's, when we open discussion and questions, I'm going to want to hear where some of you are from and in a specific way. So place is really the foundation of the work I do for Heritage Saskatchewan um, because place for me is it's an unalterable fact of people's lives. We all live in place somewhere and in uh, identifying ourselves and situating ourselves within that place we have an entry into understanding how living heritage shapes our lives, our identities, our families, our communities, and society as a whole. So, and here I'm gonna, I have a bad habit. I, have, I write, wrote great notes and I have a habit of deviating away from them because I get excited about what I'm talking about. So I'm just gonna return to my notes here. Um, and before I, I move on from where I'm from, I want to just speak about how the importance of understanding where I come from has really shaped my of course my own life but also how I go about my work in this province with living heritage and growing up on that farm in southern Saskatchewan um, I really believed that I had to leave 
Saskatchewan, that the important things in the world happened elsewhere. And though I was steeped in the folklore of my home region, I was intimately acquainted with the intangible cultural heritage of it. I had no, I, I didn't have language for what that was. I didn't have any kind of uh, framing to understand that importance. And so it was something that simply seeped into me, shaped who I was and something I carried with me everywhere I went. But it wasn't until I studied folklore and came back home that I really started to understand how important this is for everyone and for our communities. Um, and so how I came back home was actually from leaving. And first of all, I did um, my, my undergraduate studies at the University of Regina in classics and medieval studies. And I fully intended to be a, a professor. And at that point, my most pressing problem was what do I focus on, classics or medieval studies? And I was lucky to have a professor, Alison Fizzard, who might be on the call today. And if she is, hi, thanks for being here. And also thanks for um, helping me shape the course of my career. <laughs> so at that time when I was like, what do I do, medieval studies or classics? She very gently let me know the state of the uh, job market in academia in Canada, <laughs> which I'm so grateful to her because really I was so determined that that's what I was going to do. And when she let me know how rare it was to actually find a position in Canada in either one of those, uh, those disciplines, I decided to expand my horizons for grad school. And I ended up uh, being accepted into the folklore program at Memorial University of Newfoundland. And I really honestly didn't know what that entailed. I, I had a very vague understanding of what folklore was until I actually arrived in Newfoundland when I realized I'd stumbled into the best possible program for my interests. And so this discipline uh, provided me with the language theories and tools to give weight to what I always intuitively knew was important and meaningful. And it also in being away in Newfoundland and seeing how Newfoundlanders uh, understand, acknowledge, and simply accept the importance of intangible cultural heritage and living heritage in their everyday lives really inspired me to return to Saskatchewan because everything that I had learned growing up, everything that I had sort of um, received by osmosis and had been transmitted to me from my, my dad, my neighbors, um, that shaped who I was and that I had always been fascinated by, now I realized this is important and you can actually study it. And this academic discipline of folklore allows me to study the place I love the most in the world, which is rural Saskatchewan. So I returned home to do my thesis work, um, which resulted in my thesis, Every Place Had a Barn. The barn is a symbol of the family farm in Southern Saskatchewan. I started a blog called The Barn Hunter and started making connections here in Saskatchewan. And in 2015, I was hired on a contract with Sask Culture as a community engagement animateur, where I took my folklore theory, my knowledge of intangible cultural heritage and the skills I'd learned as a graduate student out into the community for the first time. I knew how things worked in Newfoundland and Labrador, which gave me a head start, but of course I had to adapt my Newfoundland experience to Saskatchewan's context. Um, and I also just wanna to note too, that as well as Newfoundland and Labrador and Quebec, um, in the United States has a really strong, they have several folklore programs and they have, um, um, a, there's a strong public folklore sector with several states employing state folklorists and publicly folk funded folk life centers. So that was what I knew of, of, of actually utilizing this discipline, this theory of folklore in practice in the public sector. And so I took the tenets of UNESCO's Convention on Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, which I'll speak about, um, quickly here or in a moment and attempted to apply them to Saskatchewan communities. So this work with SAS culture got me out into community for the first time, getting excited about taking these, these theories and this methodology and actually seeing how do communities respond to this. Meanwhile, at the same time at Heritage Saskatchewan, um, the CEO Ingrid Kazakoff and research coordinator Sandra Massey were becoming increasingly interested in living heritage, intangible cultural heritage, and seeing the need for that work to be done in Saskatchewan. In 2012, Sandra Massey uh, had written the foundational document of our work in living heritage for Heritage Saskatchewan called Living Heritage and Quality of Life, Reframing Heritage Activity in Saskatchewan. It's a great document, it's available on our website. Um, so they were already interested in this work and fortuitously I was coming back home to Saskatchewan and all the stars and planets aligned 
and I was um, brought into the fold at Heritage Saskatchewan to uh, put living heritage into practice. And so I started out as uh, the Intangible Cultural Heritage Development Officer, which was a term that we um, stole, borrowed from Newfoundland and Labrador, where my mentor, Dale Jarvis, uh, also a folklorist, held that position. Uh, though in Newfoundland, it's a, it's a provincial a government position because they've, that province has legislated uh, the UNESCO Convention on the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. So sharing this background is, um, you know, gives you some insight into how Heritage Saskatchewan got into this work and how I've developed and evolved my, my practice over time. And uh, yeah, the sharing of self and identity, which I'm giving with you right, giving to you right now is reflective of the kind of work I do in community where um, when I ask that first question, where are you from? That's the first thing we do as a group when I'm working in community, I ask that question, tell me about where you're from. Because when people, when it's, it's a much easier question, first of all, than asking, tell me about yourself, tell me who you are. When you ask, where are you from? People always end up telling me who they are or who they see themselves to be and how they place themselves in their community. And that's the beginning of our work together. So I'm gonna share a few terms with you. I'm not gonna dwell on them because I know that all of you on this call today are research oriented folks. And so you are, of course, you can follow up with some of these terms if you're, you're interested. Um, but this is, you know, a foundation. Um, it's theoretic, this is, um, sorry, I'm getting away from my notes here. Yes, I wanna spend the bulk of our time together speaking about community and real world, ex world experience. However, um, using some of these, defining some of these terms is helpful um, to get us all on the same page and to understand the theoretical and method methodological framework for um, ethnographic field work, which is my background that I take into my community work. So first of all, I'm just going to use, I'm going to uh, use this American Folklore Society definition of folklore, uh, though for, or description of it. It connects people to their past. It is a central part of life in the present and is at the heart of all cultures, including our own throughout the world. Including our own is a really important uh, uh, delineation there. In some ways, folklore and anthropology are sometimes sort of uh, conflated, but they're definitely different disciplines. Um, but folklore, in some ways, I've heard it described as it's, it's local anthropology, if that is of any use to anyone. And I couldn't help but use this little meme here of Taylor Swift, who recently um, released an album called Folklore. And so a bunch of folklorists started putting memes together, um, just sort of tongue in cheek a little bit about this pop star uh, using that term folklore, which is often can be misunderstood. It has sometimes negative connotations like, oh, folklore, that's just old wives tales. That's nonsense. Um, when we study old wives tales and nonsense, but folklore in of itself as a discipline um, studies people's um, expression basically in place. Again, I'll keep coming back again and again to place. All right, so living heritage moves away from a focus on the preservation of the past to a focus on how the past is used in a contemporary context. This comes from Sandra Massey's work, which I mentioned uh, just a moment ago. Traditional knowledge is a term that's often used in indigenous context. Um, although there is no universally accepted definition of traditional knowledge, the term is commonly understood to refer to collective knowledge of traditions used by Indigenous groups to sustain and adapt themselves to their environment over time. This information is passed on from one generation to next within the Indigenous group. Such traditional knowledge is unique to Indigenous communities and is rooted in the culture of its people. The knowledge may be passed down in many ways, including following storytelling ceremonies, dances, arts and crafts. Uh, so on and so forth, as you can read there. Um, I had trouble tracking down a, a, a definition of traditional knowledge, and this is why I like using this one, because it acknowledges that up the top, that there is no universally accepted definition. But this is, you'll see traditional knowledge, or TK, uh, referred to uh, in, in different, uh, especially in the Indigenous context or Indigenous studies context. Finally, the term I'll use, which is the one that um, is, its importance will become clear as we go throughout the presentation, is intangible cultural heritage. And this is defined, this UNESCO has 
an entire convention defining what intangible cultural heritage is, the UNESCO Convention on the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, which to date Canada is one of just a handful of countries who have not signed that convention. Um, but as I mentioned, Newfoundland has legislated it, Quebec also has. Um, and I use it, as you'll see in my work, as a, a foundational sort of framework for my community engagement work. Um, so there's five domains of intangible cultural heritage, oral traditions, performing arts, social practices, rituals, and festive events, knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe, the knowledge and skills to produce traditional crafts. And it is ICH, you'll hear me refer to it that way, is traditional, contemporary, and living at the same time. It's inclusive, it's representative, and it's community-based. So those definitions... And again, I don't want to deviate too far from my notes here because I will get off track. Um, uh, these definitions, I hope you'll see that they're really saying the same thing, which is that heritage, culture, traditional knowledge is what we've carried from the past with us into the present. So a note on these terms, um, one thing I've, un I've come to understand in my community work, and when I say community, I mean, you know, people living out in small towns or in cities across Saskatchewan or on First Nations um, who come from, you know, they have different occupations, uh, different genders, different um, cultural backgrounds, but they're coming together as some sort of a self-defined group of community. And so I realized that those terms are important for us, for practitioners and for academics, but they're not, the community members really aren't interested in that, in those terms. And um, so, yeah, so the terminology that I use as a heritage profession, professional is of marginal importance to communities. What they want to do is learn about, discover and utilize their own unique heritage. And it's my job to help them get started down that path. And the language we use is just a framework, though we can spend a lot of time and do quibbling over it at uh, conferences and in papers. Laura Jane Smith, the author of Uses of Heritage, uh, writes about the authorized heritage discourse, a theory describing the common practice in which the expert tells a community what's important about its heritage and how it should be interpreted. And this is a, pr a problem amongst heritage professionals and academics. Uh, it's something I really try to guard against. And as I've gone through my work over the past five years uh, for Heritage Saskatchewan, I have realized how important it is to not go into a community with a preconceived notion of what they should be documenting or preserving or interpreting, or in the process of learning about the community, getting really excited about something and, and sort of trying to steer them in that direction. It's really important to listen to what the community thinks is important about its heritage and what it wants to do with it, how it wants to interpret it. So um, I first want to speak, I'm going to move into community, my community engagement work now, what I actually have done and do with Heritage Saskatchewan. And I first want to speak about uh, my failures, <laughs> because it was from those that I learned um, how to more effectively work in community. So as I mentioned, I worked for SAS Culture first, and I, I did a lot of introductory workshops just talking about what intangible cultural heritage is, and then using those five domains of intangible cultural heritage to basically pull out, dredge up, um, you know, excavate the living heritage, the intangible cultural heritage that was just sort of lying in the minds, memories, material culture of the communities I worked in. What what was their intangible cultural heritage? It was always a really exciting exercise for all of us. But once we'd done that work of pulling it out and sort of discovering it, if you will, or rediscovering it or, um, you know, putting a name to it, what do you actually do with it? And this is where I really um, like the UNESCO uh, Convention on the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage because it provides these four concrete goals, which are a great uh, starting point or foundation for a project. So those goals are documentation, recognition and celebration, transmission and community development, including economic. So my failure, my first, my first community that I decided to delve in deeper and um, try to create, you know, see how, how can intangible cultural heritage actually work? How can we do something with it now that we've pulled it out in a community? And I had um, 
my first goal with this was in the town of Shaunavin, which coincidentally our CEO Ingrid Kazakoff um, lives and worked for 30 years at the Grand Coteau Heritage and Cultural Center. However, my connection with the community was forged um, before I worked for Heritage Saskatchewan. Um, though it certainly helps having Ingrid's connection, which as an aside, I will say is one of the most important aspects of my community work, uh, which is being connected and having a, a relationship with the community before a project begins. Um, this does not just mean working in communities you already know, but as, as you will see, I'll get to that later, but as a newly fledged folklorist at the time working in the field, starting in a place where I was comfortable and welcomed was helpful. Um, so the failure I had there was definitely a buildable failure. Nothing terrible happened, but just nothing really came out of it. Um, at the time when I began, I saw myself as an arm's length facilitator, someone to guide the process, but not actually implement the process. Um, so the problem was no one in the community had the time or the expertise or the resources to sort of actually implement a process and, and, and see a project through. Um, so no matter how much I encouraged or provided ideas or advice or examples, there was no precedent for what an ICH project could actually look like in a rural Saskatchewan context. And the examples I had, like, this, this is what they did in Newfoundland, is it's nice to see, but how do you actually make that happen? And so I realized, you know, I needed to, I needed to see through a project myself. And so that being said, even though in Shaunavin we didn't have, you know, a tangible kind of deliverable and output, we certainly did a lot of great work together, community building exercises. And I do think several years later, you know, um, when I hear about what's going on in Shaunavin, I think some of the seeds that we planted during my time working there in 2015, uh, early 2016, I think some of those seeds have sprouted into some exciting things. Um, but what we what we went to next what i started to do next was after the shaunavin experiment i realized yeah we need a, you know a project it needs to have a cohesive a theme there needs to be something to build upon that's going to draw the community going to draw a community together something that everyone can agree has importance to them and something that you know we can take those four goals from unesco and try to actually make that happen and have something come out of it. And so the first living heritage project we completed was Cole and Cornac. And this began, um, Cornac is a, has, it's one of um, two communities in Saskatchewan that is, uh, has a coal industry and they have a power plant. So they mine coal and then the coal is burnt to produce electricity for the province of Saskatchewan. About 300 jobs in a town of about 700 people. It's very important to the region as a whole and the town of Cornac itself really wouldn't exist in its current form without that coal industry. And when I first started the project in 2016, um, the federal moratorium on coal hadn't yet been announced. Um, and yet, you know, it's sort of like the writing was eventually going to be on the wall for that plant. Um, and as of today, it's scheduled to be shut down in 2029. And that was the case in 2016 as well. So I started this project actually right before that moratorium was announced. You can only imagine kind of some of the politics and stuff that came out, but I won't get into that. The point is that coal is important to everyone in Coronac. And I led with that instead of the H word, as we called it, Heritage Saskatchewan, because sometimes when you say the word heritage, people think, oh, boring you know, senior citizens, uh, not relevant to me. And it can be hard to get a community, you know, get more than people who are already interested in heritage to get involved. So we started, we led with this, Cole and Cornac. And um, in the end, we have this booklet as well as a 45 minute documentary um, that tells the story of Cornac, basically in the words of Cornac's own people. Um, this booklet is written, there's essays in it written by local people, including high school students. I worked with high school students um, and, and then the documentary talking about how coal shaped Cornac over time and also asking that scary question, what happens without coal in Cornac? So after the success of this project, um, oh yeah, so I just, I want to make a point here too that all of these projects that I'm going to be speaking about now are tied to a specific community. And so the stories and the experiences belong only to that community. And yet the projects touch upon larger themes that are relevant to other Saskatchewan communities as well. And they're really meant to serve as a model for how communities can interpret elements of their own living heritage. 
Um, and I'm going to use a quote here from Ray Bowman, who's a rural studies uh, researcher who says, if you've been to one rural community, you've been to one rural community. And I'd say that of all communities, um, they all have their own unique living heritage. And so each of these projects is singular to that community. And yet, like I said, has uh, relevance in a larger picture. So our next project was Valmarie, um, the Valmarie Elevator, which came out of in 2016, the National Trust for Canada designated wooden grain elevators as one of Canada's most endangered places. Uh, and yet they continue to disappear at a, at a, a rapid rate. Um, and the community of Valmarie, which has about 85 people year round, had recently raised over $100,000 and restored their 1927 heritage elevator. And they had restored the exterior of this elevator, but they were wondering where to go next. And they hadn't um, really dug into the actual story of that elevator. And again, I utilized a community connection I had made through a workshop I hosted there. And this project resulted from that. Again, we worked with youth, high school students. Um, and then our third project was Gimio Pimachinan, which is Mitchif for It Was a Good Life. Um, this was in partnership with the G Gabriel Dumont Institute and um, Saskatchewan Urban Native Teacher Education Program at the University of Regina. This project was more hands-off for me in that um, all of these projects, the bulk of the content is produced by community members. But in Gimio Pimachinan, um, it really was, uh, we were sort of a guiding force. It was like what I had wanted to do originally in Shaunavin, where we sort of get the ball rolling and then the community takes it for, takes it from there. And that's what happened with Gimio Pimachanan and the community in that case was uh, Métis, two classes in the SunTEP program at the University of Regina, um, Métis history course or Métis genealogy course and uh, an art class who worked together and interviewed community members from the Mitchiff community in Saskatchewan to create this living heritage uh, project. So I know that I'm already, time is, is moving on quickly. Um, so those are the three first sort of concrete projects that we've completed. I've also uh, working with Cumberland House, um, Pheasant Rump, Nakota First Nation on some documentation projects that we hope will turn into fully fledged living heritage projects. COVID has put a bit of a wrench in some of those plans for this year, of course. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, community connections are paramount. It's through people and their dedication to their own community's heritage that things happen. So in these living heritage projects, I started with low hanging fruit, communities where I had connections already. Meanwhile, so that's Cornac Valmarie. Meanwhile, all throughout that time, I was also doing the work of creating connections in communities that have historically been neglected namely Indigenous and Northern communities. So I nurtured relationships, made visits, allowed the connections to strengthen and deeper over time, deepen over time. And so some of these like Cumberland House and Pheasant Romp may um, result in a fully fledged project. Uh, they may take the ideas and, and run with it in their own way, um, or perhaps it won't go any further than it has already, but regardless, the relationship building is the key to doing this type of work in my, in my view. Um, and meanwhile, I wanted to also highlight, you know, I've, you know, there's been lots of communities in Saskatchewan who've taken these concepts and run with them on their own accord. And some of them, you know, I did a workshop there once and they took that material and did their own projects. Sometimes they've, um, they're working with ICH or Living Heritage without any um, connection with us at Heritage Saskatchewan. And um, so I just wanted to highlight uh, the Cirrus Moose Creek region here. Uh, the town of Oxbow, they had in their community planning document, their municipal plan, intangible cultural heritage was is in that plan. And it's in a lot of plans, I know. Um, but they had Tammy Scott, a dedicated um, employee at the town who actually wanted to, to do something with that. And she did. And she got grants through SAS Culture. And they created um, a whole bunch of programming and documentation. Uh, and that's one example. The town of Humboldt has also done work with ICH, Chrono, Indian Head. And I know there's many others. Um, so finally, today, our most current living heritage project is um, COVID-19 culture. As we adjusted our lives in the wake of the ongoing pandemic, it became apparent that we are collectively living through a historic situation. So back in, I think, April, May, I proposed a documentation project to capture the experiences of Saskatchewan people living through the early months of the pandemic. Uh, we partnered with the Saskatchewan History and Folklore Society to make this project happen 
Our goals are to include the voices of people historically underrepresented or misrepresented in historic record, historical record, and to frame the interviews through a lens of living heritage. We ask questions to learn if culture and heritage helped people interpret COPE and look beyond the crisis as well as just questions about how the crisis has affected their lives. So we contracted six coordinators from around the province to collect interviews from their communities, ensuring we had a good geographical representation. Five of our coordinators are Indigenous, and the 38 interviews we've collected, actually 39 now we've collected to date, will be edited into a special edition of Saskatchewan History and Folklore's Folklore Magazine. Um, and the raw interview data will be donated to the Provincial Archives of Saskatchewan, where it will serve as a record of this unprecedented event into posterity, in the words of real Saskatchewan people. So we're just working on the editorial process of that now. Um, and I should also mention all of our living heritage projects that we've done to date, all of the, the documentation, um, all of that goes into the Provincial Archives of Saskatchewan so that it's available. So what I hope that I've imparted through sharing my experiences um, working in living heritage in Saskatchewan is the importance of, of process, which I haven't had time to delve more deeply into that. But I find that it's necessary to separate process from outcome. And it's the process of relationship building, which occurs between me and the organization Heritage Saskatchewan um, and the community. So we have a relationship, but more importantly, within the community itself. Um, I see myself as brokering or facilitating opportunities for people to come together and discuss what's important and relevant to their community and conversations that may not have happened otherwise. So, and here, um, this, this slide here, living heritage is a practice. It's something we do in our everyday lives and it's doing we conceive of ourselves in our relationship to our families our community society and perhaps more important most importantly to place places where culture is born and expressed through tangible and intangible forms living heritage is a creative act and in the work that i do i'm attempting to harness that creativity that already exists in communities and and channel it um, into projects that elevate heritage and its importance because that's our our MO as an organization. Um, I have some sources and suggested reading here, which if any of you are interested in this, you can get a hold of me after and I can, I can direct you to that. And um, as, we, as we conclude here, I wanna make sure I leave some time for discussion. Um, I wanna end how we began, which is to ask, where are you from? Um, so before I open the floor, um, I just want to conclude that a community's heritage is made up of its environmental context, its buildings and monuments, its documentary record, however that may be defined, and most importantly, by its people, those who continue to live in the community and those who've passed away or moved on, but have left remnants of themselves and their experiences behind in memory, story, material, culture, vernacular, architecture, and ways of doing things. People's connections with the land, the environment, with each other, and with the stories they tell about themselves and their community are what makes up its living heritage. And in talking about it, uh, bringing it to light, elevating it, we are encouraging communities to reflect on themselves, assess themselves, and perhaps to conceive of their fu futures in a conscious and informed way. If we understand where we come from and how that has shaped our worldviews, we are in a much better position to tackle the giant issues that all communities are faced with. Economic transition, environmental degradation, depopulation or overpopulation, climate change, immigration and reconciliation. The work of this happens on the ground for we all live local lives. It is not easy, quick or foolproof, but it is essential and it is simple. Tell me about you, your place and what it means to you and we will begin. And so I love this quote here from Henry Glassy, except to begin, that tradition is the creation of the future out of the past. <laughs>